still remember the first time that I noticed her on the screen. That was in the 1982 comedy, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. In my review of that movie, I wrote, how could they do this to Jennifer Jason Lee? How could they put such a fresh and cheerful person in such a scuzz pit of a movie? Don't you know they have a star on their hands, unquote. You're really a good kisser. Yeah, so are you. You want to take off your clothes, Mom? You first. Both of us at the same time. What I didn't realize was they didn't put Lee in that movie. She put herself in it. Throughout her career, she's been attracted to sexy and risky roles. The summer may be over, but the wildlife isn't. <laughs> the wildlife is the latest teenage sex comedy to hit town, and it is being billed as some kind of sequel to the big hit of a couple of years ago, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, both films sharing the same writer. Now, I didn't think Fast Times at Ridgemont High was all that special, but compared with The Wildlife, Fast Times was one of the ten greatest films of all time. <laughs> the Wildlife tells the story of a graduating high school student learning about the wildlife in the summer before college starts. And for starters, he takes his own swinging singles apartment. <laughs> How did you fly it in last night? Mm, really late. I was exhausted. Ladies, hello. Hi, I'm Bill Conrad. I'm up in Unit 93, and you are not interested. Well, she's just one of his problems. Here comes another. To help pay his rent, he takes in a boarder, a loud and obnoxious friend. See, the thing is, a lot of doctors live at this end of the complex, so we have to be quiet if we want to stay here. Okay. Fantastic microwave, Bill. This is great, man. Did you about that lady put a poodle in a microwave? Blew up. Gonna try that sometime. What are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Look, don't go through my drawers. This is my room. Your big room's room. mine! No, wait, Drake. Hey, that's not fair, man. Absolutely not. Hey, you're the guy who needed a roommate. You're the guy who needed the bread. Yeah. So, let's flip. Okay. Heads. You lose. Two out of three. No, come on, two no. out of three. I found this place, please. For you. Heads. You lose. You want to clear your stuff out of the room? They're a real couple of lively guys, aren't they? <laughs> that was Christopher Penn with the peroxided hair. You may remember him as the sweet country boy in Footloose, and he was very good in that picture. Not here. His character is a total boor. The Wildlife is, again, one of those teenage films that insults half the human race, women, with images of girls and women as pieces of meat to be had or as strippers to entertain the boys in the world. In one scene, and it's my least favorite scene in the picture, we see that same blonde-headed guy finally convinced at the end of the picture his reluctant girlfriend, she's now going to marry him or at least have sex with him. It's hard to tell in this film. And how does he do it? He picks her up and he throws her in the backseat of his convertible. And that's a real shame. It's not funny. It's a real shame because that young woman, until that scene, had been the freshest, most lively, most independent soul in this picture. I hated to see her turn into a sap like everyone else in this film. Uh, I'm in total agreement with you. This movie was a real, real depressing experience to sit through. And I just want to take one little area, and that would be the Christopher Penn character, mm -hmm. which is based on the Sean Penn character right. that his brother played in uh, uh, the guy's Fast Times. The guy who said right. awesome at the end. And yeah, on this time, instead of uh, awesome, the word is casual. And you know, it's funny. You know, you wouldn't think so, but awesome is a funnier word than casual. Yes. And <laughs> Ridgemont High is a funnier movie than this is. Yes. The difference, obviously, he's also ripped off from John Belushi in Animal House, who was a character that inspired half of these movies. Right, Bluto. Belushi was an animal. He was crushing beer cans against his head, but nevertheless, right. he created a person who behaved like this, and so we could believe him. This kid 
frankly, I'm sure he's a good actor, or maybe he has a career ahead of him, but in this movie, he's a geek. Yeah. And I knew that the moment he started eating lighted joints and yeah. swallowing them and then right. blowing out smoke right. from his stomach or something. Yeah. I'm thinking, maybe it is possible to do that, but I don't want to see well, it done. E either that or you see the whole picture. The big, another big running gag is seeing two guys run together and butt their heads. Yeah, real true. Not funny. Yeah. Not funny. And then it is mean. You know, when these films turn from comedy to meanness, mm -hmm. it, and it's degrading, you sort of feel a little bit embarrassed of being there. And I felt that throughout this picture. I agree. All right. Our next film is called say anything and it is something quite special a rare film about young people in love that is not exploitive not superficial not lecherous not well not like anything i've seen in quite a while from american movies say anything begins with the brightest prettiest girl in school telling her classmates that she is desperately afraid of the future and that's a refreshing jolt of candor right away at the beginning of the film then an awkward young man asks her for a date you busy on friday yeah i have to help my father are you busy on saturday Saturday, I have some things to do around the house. So you're, so you're monumentally busy? Well, not monumentally. That's Ione Skye as the girl John Cusack plays the nervous boy. He's even more nervous when he meets her father on their first date. Look, I know you're busy. You don't have to entertain me, but uh, you can trust me. Uh, I'll tell you a couple things about myself. I'm 19. I've been overseas for a couple semesters. Now I'm back. I'm an athlete, so I rarely drink. I can kickboxing. You ever heard of kickboxing? Sport of the future? Don the Dragon Wilson, Benny the Jetter Keaton, Murray Smith, some of the champions of the sport. I can see by your face, no. My point is you can relax because your daughter will be safe with me for the next seven to eight hours, sir. Say Anything gives us a rare frank father-daughter relationship as Ione Skye tells John Mahoney, playing her father, about her feelings for Cusack. So we started spending all this time together as friends. But I could feel him getting anxious. And then I knew that there would be a confrontation over getting physical. <clears throat> he started to get that look at the end of the night. Do you know that look? And then you know it's going to be an issue. So I went through all the different feelings and all the different arguments you're supposed to go through. Did he ever get rough with you? Dad, no. But I didn't want any problems, so I decided not to sleep with him. But then I attacked him anyway. That's very fresh writing. Say Anything was written and directed by Cameron Crowe, who also wrote Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and he certainly knows the speech patterns and moods of young people. Their nervousness, their idealism, their bravado, their fragility. Cameron Crowe's script also reflects the randomness of life, with surprising things happening to the girl's father. It's a rich, textured film that reminded me of The Accidental Tourist, but this done at the adolescent level, with its heartbroken and heartwarming characters struggling just to stay afloat. I admire Say Anything very, very much. I admire it, too, and not only for Ione Skye and uh, John Cusack, but also for John Mahoney as the mm -hmm. father, because yes. this is very much a real movie about parents and yes. the problems that they can have and the troubles they can get into. Yes. The parents here are not seen as some kind of distant, stupid uh, people who just kind of want to mess up their kids' lives, but as people who are very complicated in their own right. And the relationship between these two young people is based upon the kinds of things that I remember happening when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. Not the dumb stuff that takes place in most teenage movies, but the real heart-tugging stuff that involves real relationships. I thought of other films that uh, this film, in terms of quality, uh, take the kids in breaking away and mm -hmm. make them a little older and, you, and the family there mm -hmm. and put them under a little bit of strain mm -hmm. and you have the same kind of story. Take the family of terms of endearment, if you will, and bring them down younger in age and you have the same kind of thing. And all of these pictures that we're talking about have in common is the kind of writing that seems very natural and yet surprising because we're inundated with so many cookie-cutter kinds mm -hmm. of pictures that don't have, represent humanity in any kind of way. It, it's so fresh to see. Say Anything is a movie, basically it's a movie about values. Mm -hmm. It's about how you want to live your life and what your standards are, and that's, that's pretty rare. Number 10 on the list, Say Anything, written and directed by Cameron Crowe, which may have looked like another teenage movie, but was actually an intelligent, perceptive story of human nature with great performances by Ione Skye, John Cusack, and John Mahoney. Number 9, Cameron Crowe, Say Anything, a most intelligent teenage love story that also featured a rare movie relationship between a troubled father and his devoted daughter. We don't get too many of those kinds of stories. You do know that, don't you? You know what I like? You don't fool me. Guys. Ten. I cannot be fooling you less. 
That's Matt Dillon and Bridget Fonda playing the dating game in Singles, the new film from writer-director Cameron Crowe, who made such a big splash three years ago with his debut film, Say Anything. That film was wise about teenagers. His new film is kind of dumb and predictable about characters in their 20s. The form of Singles is a series of vignettes, including Bridget Fonda from Single White Female, as a good girl who is drawn to a funky rock singer played by Matt Dillon. I know what you're thinking. We made the connection, and when you make the connection, it's like chemistry takes care of itself. I mean, it makes its own decisions, you know? So you gotta just sit back and enjoy it, because you know when it's real, and this is real, and we just don't even have to discuss it. Janet, you're spazzing off on me. Later, the film comes back to their story for a pointless blackout sketch involving a telephone call. I've got no underwear on. I need to be touched. I'm burning for you, Cliff. I think you got the wrong number, lady, but I'll be right over. Now that's a dumb joke, a waste of time. Another waste of time is a couple played by Campbell, Scott, and Kira Sedgwick here on a first date. Our project spent last year studying the um, Alaskan excellence bill. Right. And, and, and now, and now with all the, all the excellent kickbacks, and I, I think it'll work out. <sighs> what? no privacy anymore. Again, a dumb gag when we want some substance between them. All told, singles tracks three couples, and the form of the film exaggerates the weakness of the basic material. We don't spend enough quality time with any of the couples to care about them before we're switched over to another couple for a few minutes. Given the quality of Cameron Crowe's work on Say Anything, I was very surprised by singles. It certainly didn't teach me a thing about the single life today. Well, of course, it's not Say Anything. Say Anything is yeah. one of the best films of its yeah. year. But this film, on the other hand, Gene, you have to take it for what it is. You say we don't have any in-depth relationships here. No. This is a blackout film. That, it's a sketch film. That's the yeah. form of the oh, film. And I didn't We're like seeing it. these couples yeah. in little vignettes, just as we might in Second City or something like that. Yeah. I think the writing is very second, bright. Yes, yes. The writing is very bright. Yeah. Some of the situations are very funny. The characters kind of grow on you in a warm way. This movie made me feel no. good as it went along. No, I didn't have any of that reaction. I, uh, there was bad. I wish that it is. I wish that there had he had selected one couple and what? stayed with them. You're yeah. always trying to rewrite movies. Why oh, no, not no. let him make no, no. this movie about three couples only... and next time he can make a movie about one couple like he did the you last know, it's time. It's just like you. I probably want to rewrite the movies that I don't like and I'm mm -hmm. perfectly happy with the ones I well, do. Well, I think he made this movie the way he wanted to I'm... and I'm glad he did because I enjoyed I it. I did. Jerry Maguire is a busy picture that tries to cover a lot of ground and does most of it fairly successfully. Tom Cruise stars very convincingly as one of the top agents in the business until he writes a memo on values and ethics, and that gets him fired by his agency. All of Jerry Maguire's clients abandon him until he's finally down to his last hope, a wide receiver named Rod, played by Cuba Gooding Jr. Show me the money! Show me the money! Yes! Louder! Show me the money! That's it, brother, but you got to yell! Show me the money! I need to feel you, Jerry! Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Congratulations, you're still my agent. You may remember Cuba Gooding from his great work on Boys in the Hood, and he's good here too as a pro player who might be able to get a better contract if he just be a little more flexible. Hey, hey, fuck! Athlete! I am not an entertainer! Fuck! These are the ABCs of me, baby! I do not dance, and I do not start preseason without a contract! Fine, fine! But off the field, Gooding has a wonderful romantic relationship with his wife. And that's an inspiration for Jerry Maguire, who discovered after he was fired that only one other person would stick by him, an accountant played by the lovable Renee Zellweger, who starts by loving his ethics and ends by loving him. I have to go in. I live here. Bonnie Hunt plays her older and wiser well, sister. I'm worried. I'm worried that you're putting all your faith in this guy who, because of the way things are going, might not have an emotional marble in his head. Laurel, please, if I start talking... You please. So what does that make me, Laurel, for taking the opportunity? Men are just different people when they're hanging on to the bottom rung. 
I like Jerry Maguire quite a lot, but I wish there had been less of it to like. There are at least two and a half movies here, and I think they could have started by getting rid of all of the distracting material about the divorced wives' support group. Then they could have made a nice movie about the cutthroat world of professional sports agents, or another nice movie about the love story between Maguire and the woman who believes in him. Both of those stories suffer a little, I think, in a movie that feels like it needs closer editing. But even in its flawed state, Jerry Maguire contains wonderful performances, a lot of insight, and some real feeling. It's far from perfect, but I liked it a lot. I uh, liked it too, maybe a little more than you. Um, I think that the, the two parts, the Sporge agent part mm -hmm. and the love story, I think is this writer, director Cameron Crowe, is, uh -huh. is saying something very important, which is that for yuppies, and this is, Cruz is the ultimate yuppie yeah. in the movies these days, that there is more to life than business success. Mm -hmm. And I think that the love story here and this performance by Renee Zellweger, who's She's been independent, this is a star-making performance. She has a tremendous she presence. She is wonderful in the film, and maybe you've got a good point here. Maybe it is richer for having all of this stuff. It seemed, though, like the movie knew so much about sports agents that I wanted to know more. I think they started out thinking it was going to be a sports agent movie, mostly, and I think that she pops off the screen so big that she dominates. And, and she does, but, you know, also, I think uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. and his wife job. do really good counterpoint to that romance, showing them what a relationship can be. Can like. be. In other words, another way of life. Yes. That there is victory and winning in love. Okay. Oh. Check, I got it. He's okay. He is on acid, though. I, I can't really tell. How do you know when it's kicked in? I am a golden god! Yeah. Billy Crudup is a rock god in the making, and Kate Hudson is the groupie who loves him and almost famous. Almost Famous is a consistently funny and exceptionally insightful rock and roll movie that spends more time behind the scenes than on stage as we see the ascension of a fictional 1970s group called Stillwater through the eyes of a boy wonder critic and the groupies who tail the band like sexy shadows. This is Cameron Crowe's first film since Jerry Maguire, and it's his own story as he really started out as a 15-year-old rock critic writing for Rolling Stone magazine. Crowe's on-screen alter ego is William Miller, played by Patrick Fugit, who seeks out legendary madman critic Lester Bangs for advice. They're going to buy you drinks. You're going to meet girls. They're going to try to fly you places for free, offer you drugs. And I know it sounds great. These people are not your friends. You know, these are people who want you to write sanctimonious stories about the genius of rock stars, and they will ruin rock and roll and strangle everything we love about it. I'm beginning to think there should be a role in every movie for Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, once William gets an assignment from Rolling Stone to write about Stillwater, he bonds with Kate Hudson's Penny Lane. How old are you? 18. Me too. How old are we really? Seventeen. Me too. Actually, I'm sixteen. <laughs> Me too. Isn't it funny? The truth just sounds different. I'm fifteen. But going on the road with a rock band is just about every boy's fantasy. Billy Crudup is pitch perfect hey, as the guitar god who tries to assure William's mother that the kid's all right. You got a great kid here. There's nothing to worry about. We're taking good care of him, and you should. You know, you should come to the show sometime. Hey, Join the hey, circus. listen to me, mister. Your charm doesn't work on me. I'm on to you. Oh, of course you would like him. Well, yeah. He worships you people. And that's fine by you as long as he helps make you rich. Rich? That's Frances McDormand, who just makes you smile every time she turns up, as do Jason Lee and Anna Paquin and Terry Chen, among others in this outstanding cast. The early 70s are not really remembered as a seminal era in rock history, but as the soundtrack reminds us in scenes like the one where the Stillwater entourage sings Elton John's Tiny Dancer, there was a lot of great music, and the bands of that time and the kids who worship groups like Stillwater were as passionate as any other generation. With its crisp writing and authentic feel for the era, almost famous, never hits a wrong note. It's the best time I've had at the movies all year. I loved this movie. I'm I loved so glad every to hear that. moment of this movie. And yeah. you know, I started out as a professional journalist at the age of 15, too. And I, in a way, this movie was my story. Did you know story. anybody named Penny Lane? No, I didn't. I wish I had. <laughs> but the thing is, you go into a situation where you're talking to adults, right. and you're the reporter. They're looking at you, and they're thinking, this is a kid but he has the power of the press. Right. And that's the way this, it's amazing. He's got an assignment from Rolling Stone, and suddenly mm -hmm. he's on the bus. 
And these rock stars, at one level, you know, they're doing drugs and they've got the groupies around. At the other level, they're protective of this kid, yeah. and they're really not bad people. And Billy Crudup, who was such a good actor, he was yeah. so good in Jesus' his Son, and here he is again, gets just the right note of this guitarist uh, who is... Uh, a rock god, as you say, but yeah. at the same time is also intimidated by the kid's mother. Definitely, because, you know, mom starts talking to him. You remember, Billy Crudup's only playing a guy who's maybe 24 years old himself, and Jason Lee is really funny as the lead singer. Oh, yeah. And the look, yeah. You know, it doesn't have a look like, oh, they got a bunch of costumes and wigs. These people really look like they're living in the early 70s. What a fantastic movie. I, people probably are not going to understand how good this movie is. It has nothing to do with whether you like rock music or anything else. It's a human story. If you like good storytelling, if, if you like, good if you like story characters you can identify with, you will like this movie. You're right. Number one, the best film of the year, and for me, that would be Almost Famous. Cameron Crowe's coming-of-age story about a 15-year-old who talks himself into an assignment from Rolling Stone magazine. Patrick Fugit plays the kid who is very serious and very dedicated and finds himself on tour with a rock band named Stillwater. Francis McDormand plays his mom, who trusts him who wants to be sure he doesn't get into trouble or drugs. And Billy Crudup is the rock god guitarist who gets a talking to on the telephone. This is not some apron wearing mother you're speaking to. I know all about your Valhalla decadence, and I shouldn't have let him go. She's not ready for your world of compromised values and diminished brain cells that you throw away like confetti. Am I speaking to you clearly? Yes, yes, ma'am. Kate Hudson has a key role as a groupie named Penny Lane, who has pledged herself to the guitarist, but has pity on this kid and helps him learn the rules of the road. We are not groupies. Penny Lane, man. Show some respect. Groupies sleep with rock stars because they want to be near someone famous. We're here because of music. We are band -aids. Almost Famous is like a Huckleberry Finn for our time, a road picture that invokes the 1970s rock scene with a lot of detail and humor, but also identifies so completely with this kid who takes his journalism career so seriously. The musicians can see he may be a kid, but he's not kidding around. Apart from all of its other virtues, this was the single most entertaining film of the year. I actually sat there thinking how much I was enjoying it. What a good time I was having. Absolutely. And yeah. Billy Crudup and Kate Hudson are going to become major stars. Oh, 20 yeah. years from now, we'll look back at this as one of the first movies for them. Although Billy Crudup's done a lot of really good work in movies that haven't been appreciated as much. The cast throughout this is really good. And I like that they took the music from the 70s seriously because there actually is good music. And they don't do the cheesy jokes about bad music from the yeah, 70s. Yeah, it's a... The kind of film, didn't you say on this show that while you were watching it, you were thinking, gee, I get to see it again. Can't wait to see it again, and yeah. I'm already looking forward to that. My choice for the year's best film last year was Almost Famous. And if you haven't seen it yet, what are you waiting for? Here's Oscar nominee Kate Hudson as a groupie who's in love with a rock guitarist, but she has pity on the 15-year-old kid who has a crush on her. I always tell the girls, never take it seriously. If you never take it seriously, you never get hurt. If you never get hurt, you always have fun. And if you ever get lonely, you just go to the record store and visit your friends. So you and Russell... No! Russell has a girlfriend. And I can't even say her name. That's Patrick Fugit as the kid who has an assignment from Rolling Stone magazine. Billy Crudup plays the rock star, and Oscar nominee Frances McDormand is the young journalist's mother. I'm, I'm Russell Hammond. So this is the famous Russell Hammond. Manhattan traffic is a nightmare, but absolutely no traffic is more of a nightmare for Tom Cruise in Vanilla Sky. It's one of six big holiday movies we'll review this week. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Roger Ebert. Vanilla Sky is one of those mind game thrillers where neither the audience nor the characters can be quite sure what constitutes reality. The movie's sensational opening shot in a deserted Times Square is only a dream, but what else is not what it seems? Tom Cruise stars as a whiz kid publisher who's having an affair with Cameron Diaz when he falls in love at first sight with Penelope Cruz. She's with his best friend, but hey, what are friends for? David Ames. And to what do I owe this pleasure? The pleasure of Sofia Serrano. We met today at the library, if you can believe that. He doesn't think his new romance will be a problem since he and Cameron Diaz are only good friends. Diaz sees it a little differently. When did you stop caring, David? Slow down, Jimmy. When you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not. Do you believe in God? 
Night. The tale of the publisher's life and loves is intercut with a mysterious parallel story in which he stands accused of murder. Kurt Russell conducts a court-appointed interrogation. Four weeks, the judge will determine your fate, so you will talk to me. There is no murder. After seeing Vanilla Sky, I knew I had to see it again, and I did, and I played with different notes and nuances the second time. What's impressive is how the performances by Tom Cruise, Penelope Cruz, and Cameron Diaz create an emotional reality even with all the confusion swirling around them. It's like a realistic movie exists inside the other stuff. The film was directed by Cameron Crowe based on the Alejandro Aminobar Spanish film named Open Your Eyes that also starred Penelope Cruz. And let me just ask one question. Is there something about the first three words of Vanilla Sky that calls into question every single other thing that happens in the entire film. Listen carefully and decide for yourself. Yeah, you're right. You have to start paying attention really from the start. And there are some other clues throughout this movie, images on television screens, and it all it all comes together yeah. beautifully. This is a spectacular film. I saw the original, and that's sort of like the acoustic version, and this is the full orchestrated <laughs> version. But Cameron Crowe does a wonderful job of lacing this all together. And you're so right about how the characters stay true to the moments they're in. So we're not really sure what's going on all the way through. I found it to be fascinating. It's, it's kind of a footnote for Tom Cruise to Eyes Wide Shut, the Stanley Kubrick picture. It involves a mask. It yeah, involves yeah. Uh, infidelities. It involves mystery about exactly what reality consists of. But it's it's more in the tradition, I think, of movies like uh, uh, Mulholland Drive, where mm -hmm. you really have to think back after you've seen it to figure out what happened. A lot of the best movies we've seen this year play around with dreams and what's real yeah. and what's not. Memento. Uh, Waking Life is another one, obviously. And this one, you know, Tom Cruise is probably the biggest movie star in the world. You've got to give him credit for doing movies like Magnolia yes. and Eyes Wide Shut, not just the Mission Impossibles, which he does as well and makes the big money, but to do, you know, to put his power yeah. behind a movie like this to get people to see Early it. in his career, he knew that there was a danger he would just be a matinee idol. And so he started right away doing yeah. pictures like Born on the Fourth of July, and he continues to look for these challenges. He should get nominated here, and several other people should as well. Where's the day? It's coming. Any second now. Any second now.